Texas men's basketball loses a tough game out in Provo and now faces an even tougher Houston team. Texas women's basketball rolled to a win without their two star players and the outlook of the NHL at the midway point of the season. All this and more coming up on College Press Box. Good evening, and welcome to College Press Box. I'm your host with the most, Carlos Salinas, and he's Tommy Yarish. We have a great show for you this evening. But first, a quick reminder before we get started here that we are sponsored by Cap Metro, Austin's very own regional public transportation provider, connecting you to work, school, play, and more. Find out more at rideatcapmetro.org. And now let's go ahead and take a look at Texas men's basketball against BYU this past Saturday, heading to Provo for the first time as BYU's members of the Big 12. BYU, one of the better defensive teams in the country, and they certainly showed that limiting Texas's offense in the second half, despite a good effort from Texas in the first half to knock down some shots. But like Texas has seen a lot this season, their kryptonite perimeter shots from the opposing team. BYU, one of the better three-point shooting teams, so it is BYU getting the 12-point victory out in Provo to start this one. Texas loses it, drops to 3-4 and four in conference play, and now faces a very tough Houston team on their home court at the Moody Center. And now back with us is our men's basketball analyst, Zach Davis, to go in-depth on the Longhorns' loss to BYU and a big game tonight against Houston. Zach, thanks for stopping by, man. Glad to be here, Tommy. Thanks for having me. Anytime, brother. It's no secret that Texas kind of hit a wall momentum-wise after they lost to BYU in Provo this past weekend after winning two straight. Where did you see the holes on this Texas team this past Saturday? Well, there were plenty of holes in this game, Tommy. First of all, the Longhorns seem to be all over the place in the roles each player plays on the court. For example, Tyrese Hunter, who's supposed to be one of the best contact finishers in the Big 12, took just three shots inside the arc and didn't go to the free throw line once. Cunningham, who's supposed to be that grimy glue guy for this Longhorns team, sat outside the arc on most offensive possessions he was a part of, which led to his two for seven shooting night on one for six from deep. Caden Shedrick, additionally, played 10 minutes and didn't grab one rebound. The guy isn't a shooter, and he becomes unplayable if you can't grab any boards on top of that. Texas is struggling to find the right roles for their guys, and if three out of the eight-man rotation are struggling to do their job, it's going to be hard to find success. The second hole I saw in this game was a lack of front court size and presence. Texas lost the game by 12 and lost to the points in paint battle by 14. Tasu is the only true five on the roster, and BYU had two guys over 6'11". Khalifa and Waterman together had their way Saturday night. With Waterman going for 17 points, game high, and Khalifa dishing a season-high eight assists. Texas struggled with their lack of size, and it's hard to determine if they will ever find an answer as March is nearly a month away. It is a valid question, Zach, and you think about the injuries this team has suffered, too, with guys like Caden Shedrick playing limited minutes, and they've turned to Brock Cunningham. That hasn't really worked rotationally, but maybe a guy like Kendall Weaver can step up like he's been here in the past and contribute some key minutes. Now, they don't have too much time, like you mentioned, not just for March, but even here in the shortcoming, as we mentioned in the preview, that They've got a national championship contender in Houston coming to town tonight. Not an easy game at all. If Texas wants to respond to that BYU loss with a huge home win tonight, what do they need to do? Well, what a game in the Moody Center tonight, Tommy. <laughs> and what a bigger night for Dylan DeSue and Max A. Smith. Houston is not number one on Ken Palm because of their offensive efficiency. Tommy, they play defense, ranking first in block percentage and steal percentage. And, and in Big 12 play alone, teams average just 52 points against the Cougars. Iowa State, who gives up the second least points in the conference, give up 62, a 10-point gap. If Texas wants to win tonight, they're going to have to feed DeSue. Houston plays small with their five guys who get the most minutes being under six foot five. Texas is going to have to find DeSue in between the low and high post where he is most effective. Desu needs to have at least 15 to 20 points tonight, which I predict will be around a third to a fourth of the team's points to take down the Cougars. Houston will most likely double Desu at some point as they love to swarm guys that get in their paint, and that's where Desu will have to stay composed, limit the turnovers, and find the true guard, Max A. Smith, who's going to have to find his spot and convert from deep at an efficient rate. It's going to have to be a big one-two punch from DeSue and A. Smith if the Longhorns want to win in their house tonight. Texas is also going to have to limit the turnovers. They've done well this season so far, but Cryer, Sheed, and Sharp average five steals together a game, and if they get their way defensively, the Longhorns are going to struggle. Houston loves to run and convert on their fast break points, so the Longhorns must limit those chances for them to have success in Moody. 
Yeah, truly a three-headed monster there at those three guards that Houston has, and they shoot the ball really well, too. Zach, it's been a roller coaster of a season already. You've got embarrassing losses and huge wins, all in the matter of days, even weeks, a horns-down debacle that's taken over the country, and plenty more. When you shut out all the noise and you wrap this season kind of into a ball right now at the end of the year, Will Texas be a tournament team, you think? And Tommy, I love that you raised this question because it really is so hard to tell. And I just want to preface this answer with saying how romantic of a season this would be if the Horns even made the tournament. The adversity, starting with the loss of Ron Holland to the G League, the injuries the Horns dealt with early in the season, and now the incident against UCF and staring outside the bubble with February around the corner. If the Horns made the tournament, it would be nothing but incredible. The adversity this team has faced throughout the year has, in my opinion, been pretty unprecedented and the path to the tournament is not an easy one, to say the least. The Longhorns still have seven ranked teams to play out of the 11 games left, with four of those games being away. Winning in the Big 12 has already proven difficult for the Longhorns, and winning away is an entirely different challenge. Texas is going to have to win five of those seven games to be comfortably in the tournament, and at least four to have a chance. The Big 12 tournament is going to be massive for Ronnie Terry's basketball team, as Texas needs to have success there as well. If they become a first round exit, their chances of making the tournament are slim. But Tommy, we still have an entire month of basketball season left. The time is now for Texas to heat up. I mean, we've seen it before. Look at last season. UConn wasn't doing too hot this time last year. Neither was San Diego State, neither was FAU, and they all played in the Final Four. North Carolina was completely out of the picture at this time in 2022. And look what they did. They took Kansas to the last possession in the title game. I know it can be hard to be optimistic, but you're also a Texans fan, and that can be difficult as well. Basketball is not football. You can afford to lose now. This sport is a game of momentum, not necessarily a game of whoever has the better roster is going to win. The time is now for the Longhorns, and it starts tonight in Moody Center against Houston, where Longhorn Nation has a unique opportunity to bring the house down. Man, Texans fans catching a little bit stray there. What, don't you, so, think, you know what, Tommy? I'm sorry I had to say that, but coming from a Texans fan to a Commanders fan, optimism is something we have to consider throughout our sports lives. I completely agree. Thank you, Zach. Really appreciate you coming on. And when we return, Robert Gonsolin will join us to talk some more about women's hoops. You won't want to miss it. We'll be back in a moment. College Press Box. The women's basketball team had a rough start to the week, falling short at home against Oklahoma. The Longhorns had a chance to bounce back against Cincinnati at the Moody Center on Saturday. Let's send it to my friend TJ Krilowitz at the Moody Center for the... Welcome back to College Press Box. The women's basketball team had a rough start to the week, falling short at home against Oklahoma. The Longhorns had a chance to bounce back against Cincinnati at the Moody Center on Saturday. Let's send it to my friend TJ Krilowitz at the Moody Center for the highlights for women's basketball. It's a good old-fashioned beat down here on Saturday afternoon at the Moody Center. The Texas Longhorns defeating the Cincinnati Bearcats 67-50. The Longhorns led throughout the entire game. They outscored the Bearcats every single period. Also out-rebounded them by 14. And then also Taylor Jones had seven blocks today, which is sixth all-time in Texas women's basketball history. So overall, a great performance for the Longhorns after a heartbreaking loss to Oklahoma on Wednesday. They'll play Thursday against Baylor and Waco, looking to make it two straight. Now joining me to talk about the past week in women's basketball is my friend Robert. Thank you for joining us, Robert. Thanks for having me, Carlos. It's definitely been an interesting week for the women's basketball team, so I'm excited to jump into it. Great. Well, Robert, starting things off, what went wrong with Texas and their loss to Oklahoma last Wednesday? I definitely have to point to the way they defended the paint and the lack of shots they took from beyond the arc. From the second quarter onward, you could really see Oklahoma starting to dominate down low. Yes. They did outscore the seniors 50 to 46 in the paint. When, when you're a top 10 team playing an unranked opponent, you can't afford to give up that much. Every time Texas scored, Oklahoma would go back on their own end, or the defending end, and score a quick bucket down low to maintain their lead. They always found a way to respond. Texas really had a hard time of closing the deficit until the final minutes of the game. On the offensive end, the Longhorns only drained three threes in the entire game. The more pressing issue is that they stopped uh, that stopped them was that they only took nine attempts. Shea Hawley and Madison Booker played lights out. 
each recording new career highs in scoring, but still, Oklahoma played lockdown defense in the second half. Texas players could hardly get off an open jump shot. The Longhorns, they're still a great team, but on Wednesday they failed to limit points down low on defense and also find a way to get more open looks. They still even played well defending the three, but when they were down to one and needed a stop, they did that absolute last thing that they could do, give up a three-pointer. In a loss that was just by four points, imagine what the outcome would have been if they just defended the, defended the ball a little bit better or even shot, the, shot it more. Okay, so they're back home again on Saturday, and they beat Cincinnati. So let's be honest, what did they do right? Well, it was their first game without the injured Madison Booker, who was Texas's highest scorer against Oklahoma. Still, the Longhorns had far better ball movement. Down low, we saw Leah Moore kick it out to Shaley Gonzalez a couple times, where she was able to drain open threes. Speaking of whom, she appeared in the starting lineup in this game and scored 13. We also saw a lot of post work done by Moore as we saw her get aggressive a few times and get some buckets down low. She ended with 16 points and was the team's leading scorer. Overall, Texas just looked a lot more fluid than they were on Wednesday. More passing that created more open shots, more assists, and got, I gotta mention, you know, the team also ended with 13 of them. The three point shooting still wasn't there as they were four for 15, but you can expect that when Madison Booker and Rory Harmon aren't playing, clearly the team looks like they were struggling less to find open shots and we're running a pure, crisp offense without those two players. And that's something I'm going to have to agree with on you. You know, with Texas, what I'm noticing is that in the first half of the game, you know, they're very, very strong, and they, you know, they kind of let their guards down towards the second half of the game. But after improving on Saturday, this weekend's performance is enough for Texas to win their next couple of games down the stretch. You know, what can they do to improve the next couple games? Right. Texas had a much better performance against Cincinnati than against OU. But to be honest, I'm not totally convinced that level of play will be enough. They have a very very tough two games coming up that will clearly test their legitness as a top 10 basketball team. They'll play at 13th ranked Baylor on Thursday and then host second ranked Kansas State on Saturday. For one thing, we still aren't sure whether Madison Booker will be back. Yesterday, head coach Vic Schaefer said in his press conference that he hopes her injury is day to day. Having Booker play this week is crucial if they want to win either game. Having Booker opens up more mid-range and three-point shooting that will allow for more creative ways to score. Shailen Gonzalez did play well on Saturday, but it will be difficult for Texas to keep that standard up to play for someone who usually comes off of the bench. Secondly, if Texas wants to be able to play with these two teams, they'll have to play like they did on Saturday, not last Wednesday. That means more ball movement and more taking shots. Passing the ball to all ends of the court, down low, up top, or wherever will force Baylor and Kansas State to exert more energy and become tired at some points in the games. Whatever they need to do, just that. The offense will need to open up for Shea Holly to shoot more. The more that she and other players shoot, the more opportunities that they have to put points on the board. And the last thing I emphasize and I really emphasize this, is defense. It was as if OU had no problem making a shot every time they went down the floor against Texas. Finding ways to stop their opponents down low will be the key to avoiding a two-point or four-point loss this week and instead winning. A stat like 46 points in the paint in a game can't happen again. I may sound like I'm making Texas a heavy underdog in these two matchups, and they do have two big injuries. However, they're still one of the top teams in the nation that can score using a wide range of other players. Along with a healthy Madison Booker, tightening up the defense and creating more open shots will give Texas a good chance to come out victorious in these two games. And I agree, Madison Booker is one of those key players that needs to recover for Texas women's basketball to get back on the grind and keep winning those games. Very, Thank you very much for the analysis, Robert. When we return, TJ Krulowitz will deliver will, will his mid-season NHL Rico. <laughs> Recap, we'll be right back. And welcome back into College Press Box. Joining us now to discuss the state of the NHL midway through the season is TJ Krulowitz. TJ, appreciate you being here, man. Thank you, Tommy. I always love talking about hockey on Press Box. We're fastly approaching the All-Star break, and there are many teams that have proven their, legit their legitimacy this year as contenders. And while it's too hard to predict who will be in the finals, we can still assess all the teams and see where they all stack up against each other. So without further ado, here are my top 10 teams this year, um, and also going to be my top league awards in April. The Stars off 
I'm going with the defending champs, the Las Vegas Knights. Vegas right now is in the big shadow of Vancouver right now in the Pacific Division, only having 64 points in 50 games. What's been going good for the squad is the talent in net. Logan Thompson has done a great job as a backup, but it's been Aiden Hill that really elevates the squad. He's first in the league in save percentage and goals against per game. The problem is, he breaks as easy as glass. And if Hill won't be ready, it's going to be tough for Vegas to repeat in April. The offense has still been very strong though. Marcus, Mark Stone leads the team with 49 points, but the defense hasn't been the best despite the great goaltending. Moving on for number 9, my next team will be the New York Rangers who sit on top of the Metropolitan Division at 63 points. The Rangers have just about everything. They have a quick and dangerous first line with Artemi Pan uh, Panarin, Vincent Trocek, and Chris Kreider who rank 3rd in power play success. They also have a great goalie in Igor Shurskitsyn who hasn't had one of his great years but still an all-star nevertheless. The Rangers are a dangerous team that can make some noise in the postseason. Now we're going to stay in the Metropolitan Division with the Hurricanes. The Hurricanes have been a dominant power play team, but what helps this team so much is their depth and quickness from the defensive line. Jacob Slavin is often overlooked as a top defensive player in the league, but he's been the anchor for this team and has really helped create an amazing penalty kill for Carolina. It's going to be interesting to see this team can make another run in the postseason. The next team I have at number seven are the Dallas Stars. Dallas is in a very competitive div division, but it hasn't stopped this squad from doing what they do best, and that's scoring goals. If you don't watch the Stars, you're missing out on this offense it's it's extremely electric a lot of people focus on Jason Robertson and with good reason he's the best goal scorer on the team but Rupe Hintz is what people would call a problem his speed has helped them become the stars leading goal scorer in the season with 22 with Ottinger and Haskinen finally coming back from injury the stars are looking like the usual dark horse of the playoffs Next team at number six, I have the Florida Panthers, who have proved that last season's Cinderella run was not a fluke. They're second in the Atlantic Division and are tied for third in the league for least goals scored against. Matthew Kachuk is still a really good skater that can put defenses or can get by defenses with ease, but Sam Reinhart has been on a tear this year, scoring 37 goals, which knots at second in the league for the season. If this team could trade for some more scoring depth before the deadline, the Panthers could be dangerous. Going back to the Central Division for number five, I'm going to highlight the Colorado Avalanche. Nathan McKinnon, he's been on a huge tear and is kind of running away with the MVP. The four leads a team that is first in goal scoring in the league with his 84 points on the season. Cal McCarr is also making a strong case for best defensive player of the year. And even without Gabriel Landeskog, this team is still doing really good. What a shocker. It seems like Colorado is always injured, but they still get the job done. There's a reason why I thought they'll be the champions of the West at the start of the season. But there's some really strong contenders in the conference, like the Edmonton Oilers, who are currently on a 16-game winning streak. You heard that right. When Edmonton replaced their head coach, Jay Woodcraft, with Chris Knoblach, the team was at 3-9-1, looking hopeless, and now they're looking like the team we thought they were. That coaching change was the best thing to happen to Ever, best thing that ever happened to this team. And let's not forget that a team of Connor McDavid will always be good. We'll see how long this winning streak goes. But at number three, I have one of the biggest surprises of the, of the season, the Winnipeg Jets. The Jets have done so well that people forget that their power play is bottom 10 in the league. Their goalie, Connor Hallebeck, is playing like the best goalie in the league, and their team gives up the least amount of goals of all teams in the league. But their lack of a star goal scorer and power play success is something that comes back to bite teams in the rear end in the playoffs. Now, at number two, the top team in the East right now would be the Boston Bruins. Yes, they're still good. Yes, they still have amazing goaltending. Jeremy Swayman and Linus Olmark have been fantastic this season like they always are. And yes, they're probably going to find a way to lose in the playoffs again. Their offenses still run through David Pasnarek and Brad Marshaw. But will this team have enough to make it to the cup? They better hope the offense can stay hot on the power play because it's going to be tough. Boston can't keep losing in unfathomable ways in the postseason. It has to change eventually. At number one, I have a team that I feel in my lifetime has never been the best team, the Vancouver Canucks. They lead the league in wins and also plus minus. JT Miller, Elias Peterson, and Quinn Hughes are all on track to score over 100 points this year. I haven't seen Vancouver play in the playoffs in years, so it's tough to see how they will perform, but it's very clear that they've been the best and most efficient team in the league so far. They've been on top of the rankings since the season started. There's no reason to stop believing in them now. We went into the teams, so now let's get into the players. Uh, and who are the top of the league awards this year? I'm going to start with the Calder Award, also known as the best rookie. We've had, we've had some great talent show up this year for the first time 
time like Adam Fantilli, Connor Zary, and Luke Hughes, but right now there still hasn't been anyone better than Connor Bedard. After a month on IR, Bedard still is first in points for rookies at 33 and goals at 15. He certainly won't be back to make his first all-star appearance, but he can potentially come back before the season ends and solidify the Calder Trophy. Now, I'm going to move to the Norris Trophy, which is the best defensive player. And it's kind of become an offensive award as of late. It really depends on who has the most points in the league, but... And, but what the Norris Trophy should be about is defense, obviously. But since it's become so offensive, I'm going with Quinn Hughes of the Vancouver Canucks. He makes the stat sheet a lot with him leading defensive men in goals and points, so you can check that off the list, but he also does what great defensive players do. He can enter the zone and strike or pass to a forward very well, and he can hold down the fort on the other side as well. You can tell because he leads the league in plus minus at 35. In a league full of top defensive talent, Hughes is making a name for himself. Now, for the uh, for the Vizina Trophy, or best goaltender. This one is a no-brainer right now. It has to be Connor Halbuck of the Winnipeg Jags. Winnipeg Jets. If Connor wasn't their goalie, this team would be looking at where they would pick in the upcoming draft. It's as simple as that. He has the most starts out of any goalie in the league and still is second in goals, uh, goal save percentage at 92.5%, and he's also ranked second at 2.17 goals against per game. The goalie who has been first in both those stats, Aiden Hill, which I said earlier hasn't had enough starts to make a difference. This this is the year that the Jets netminder gets the trophy, I believe. And at last, the top player of the league, the Hart Trophy. What started to become the McDavid Trophy as of late has become very competitive now. Connor McDavid not being at the top of points and goals and also being injured at the start of the year. So you have a lot of players, though, this year that has been really good. You have Nikita Kucherov. You have Austin Matthews. You also have Artemi Panarin. But who stands out to me right now is Nathan McKinnon. McKinnon leads all skaters in points at 84. He's fourth in goals at 30 and third for game winners at 7. When I went to see the Avalanche play the Stars in early January, I saw McKinnon with one of his overtime game winners winning goals, and I knew he was on a mission this year. I had no clue, though, that he was going to score four goals in one game twice in a season. Here's a fun stat for you. McKinnon has more goals when he uh, more goals this season where he scored four goals this game uh, in a game than games where he doesn't record a single point. He has been nothing short but the most valuable player for his team. But with that being said, I'm going to end this segment just like the last time I came on Press Box to talk about the NHL, and that is that hockey is the most predictable sport out there, and that anything possible can happen and that a lot of these could be different when we arrive in April for the Stanley Cup playoffs. And that's what makes the sport so electric and exciting. Thank you, Tommy. Well, thank you, too, Jay. I really like your Rookie of the Year pick, by the way. And when we return, we will recap the past week in Longhorn Sports. We'll be right back. Welcome back into the College Press Box. Let's take a look at this past week in Longhorn Sports. Starting off, Texas women's basketball's Taylor Jones is among the 10 finalists for the Lisa Leslie Award, given each year to the best center in women's college basketball. Jones is averaging 13.8 points per game and 7 rebounds per game this season, and her 27 blocks this year are a big reason why she's one of the finalists. And Texas X, Kyle Shanahan advanced to the second Super Bowl as he heads as the, set, as the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers on Sunday. The 49ers defeated the Detroit Lions in a very close game of 34-31 in the NFC Championship game. Number four, Texas men's tennis picked up another victory last week over UTSA, defeating the Roadrunners 4-1. to one. UTSA won the doubles point to start the match, but the Longhorns went on to win four straight in singles matches to secure the victory. Now, let's take a look at this week's in Longhorn Sports. Men's basketball takes Houston tonight at 8 p.m. on ESPN, and women's basketball heads to Waco, Texas to face the Baylor Bears at 7.30 on Thursday night. Men's basketball will battle TCU Horned Frogs on the road on Saturday at 1, and women's basketball will host the ranked fourth team in the country, Kansas State, on Sunday at 1 p.m. And that's going to do it for this week's episode of College Press Box. Thank you to everybody for tuning in, and thank you to everyone in our back room, including our executive producer, Jason Canander. Don't forget to tune in to our other shows this week, like College Crossfire on Wednesdays at 9, and the 1-0 Sports Show on Friday mornings at 10. That's it for me. I'm Tommy Yarsh. He's Carlos Salinas for TSTV Sports. Have a great night.